thank you for joining us. This is uh, Jim Black with the TFYLP podcast, uh, here interviewing the famous and wonderful Mr. Peter Spellos. Greetings, everybody. How are you? Known to you as uh, the voice of Robots in Disguise 1.0, Skybite, Vertigon General, and enthusiast of haiku poetry. <laughs> How true. Yes. So, uh, uh, Mr. Spellos. Uh, Peter, first of all. All right, Peter. Peter. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your, your background, where you came from. Grew up in New York City. Uh, first was on stage in sixth grade, like everybody else, you know, doing uh, Pirates of Penzance. And then uh, went to high school is really where I found that um, theater was a release of uh, expression. Didn't know, you know, it was, wasn't pretty, it wasn't really athletic, but, you know, I found out that if you were in theater, you could communicate. It was a, it was an avenue for my expression, and I was a big comedy fan, so I wanted to be like Abbott and Costello and Laurel and Hardy and all that stuff. But I also found that if you made the girls laugh, <laughs> you were very popular. So I went, hmm, hmm, boys, if you're listening out there, make the girls laugh, yes. or the boys, whatever you like, doesn't matter. Just make them laugh. After the best medicine, absolutely. So that was it. And I went to college for acting and got a BFA degree and. Uh, at 21, moved. I was in New York City. I moved into the New York and started my uh, career there, where I did uh, improvisational comedy uh, with the First Amendment Improv Company back in 1977 is when I started doing that. And, uh, my partner and I were the morning comedy team on WPLJ FM, which is a a ABC FM radio station in New York. Okay. So it was terrific. And then at about 34, I decided I had to end my film and TV career. I moved out to LA and was there for 23 years. Phenomenal. Yeah. All right. Uh, so uh, your your beginnings as an actor. Um, what, once you got your, you said BFA degree. Mm -hmm. uh, what what was like? What where where did you really kind of kick into the high gear and really get started and get a good foothold into the into it, the business? It really was the First Amendment Improv Company because I knew I had done a little improv in high school and. I had done a lot of stand-up in high school with partners, so that, that had always been working for me. But improv was really the keys to the creative kingdom. I found that I'm fast, I'm funny, I'm big, you know, I was very physical back in the day, and I was performing with terrific people, and you know, going live every you know, two, three, four nights a week after a while was terrific. It really gave me the confidence to do to do anything, because if you can make stuff up in front of a live audience, you know, they'll go, can we get a location, a doctor's office, begin. If you can deal with that, then when they give you a script, that, you know, it becomes much easier. Fantastic, fantastic. All right, um, and uh, for, from that point, what, uh, what was it or, or, or why did you uh, pursue uh, the avenue of voice acting? I didn't pursue voice it, acting? it pursued me. Yeah. I, I had done, again, I had done radio in New York, and when I was in uh, California, I moved out there in 1989, my stuff was film and TV, that's what I was working, I was doing a lot of films and TV, and a buddy of mine called uh, while I was on the set of FBI and the Untold Story, and said, can you come in for an audition? I said, no, I'm filming. He said, well, call the director, we need someone for a role tonight. Um, called them up, I literally was standing at a payphone. You kids out there have to look up payphone. Um, and pulled the plate out of the garbage with, and I had a pen and wrote the script down that he wanted and did the audition on the phone and booked it. And it wound up being a, uh, a series called, uh, so long ago, Jim, Space Strikers for Fox Kids. Okay. Where I played, believe it or not, my first thing, a shark creature <laughs> called Admiral Malco. And I got to say one of those great science fiction lines, I'll do it right to camera. Set a course for Earth. And I was like, I thought, I'm doing voiceovers now. Well, I wound up doing, I had no idea it was a recurring role. Uh -huh. I wound up doing 12 episodes of this series. And the director asked me to audition for the next series, which was Battletech. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. I booked that. So the first two voiceover series I went out for, I booked. And all of a sudden, it was like, I guess I can do this. I'd also taken a, uh, um, a dubbing course. And, and just to kind of get facile with that, and was, it took to it, you know, like you, some people could ride a bike right away, it was just something I, I, I could do right away. Mm -hmm. And I just started booking from there, you know, it's a very small community, and 
people start to know you and bring you in for auditions and it just kept going. It really was my secondary career with that, with the with the film and TV. But I had never uh, planned on becoming a voice actor. I'm an actor. Sure, sometimes sure. I'm a voice actor. Sometimes I'm a film actor. Sometimes I'm a TV actor. But the more you can do, the more they hire you for. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and uh, on on that same note, how? How did you land the role of Skybite in uh, Transformers Robots in Disguise? I was working um, for a company, you know, I never know what names to mention, but uh, um, I don't even remember what the name of the company was. But I believe it might have been Saban. I, I'm not sure if it was Saban, it was later, but I was working with uh, Jamie Simone, who's a terrific mm -hmm. director and producer, mm -hmm. just a great guy. And again, when you start to do this little community, they know what you can do. Um, I didn't. Do, I, I always thought I was the worst voice actor in the group because they could do so many voices, and I basically did me and variations of the voice and could do a couple. But I considered myself more a, of an actor. You know, I, I never grew up doing impressions or anything like that. Jamie brought me in. He was the only thing I auditioned for was Skybite. He says, "I got something for you. I really think it's right. I want you to audition for it." Um, I did, and I booked it. Nailed it on the first Just, try. I, I guess you, you know Fantastic. it was. But you work with these people; they always this is such a tight knit community, and and the people just know you. And it was very friendly. And sometimes I was saying before they they got two pages of dialogue for you, got two weeks of dialogue for you, or they got a line. It really didn't matter to me because I was doing what I love with really terrific creative people. You know, a lot of the actors in the series and the Transformers were also the writers and the directors of the session. Uh -huh. and, and because of my improv background, the more weird I got, the more weird they wrote for me. You know, <laughs> and let me go kind of berserk. Sure. And, and it was just a great time in the booth with those guys. It really was so, so you were very much in your element? I was, absolutely. You know. Who wants a real job? When you, <laughs> and I've had more than too many of those, and uh, I just felt very fortunate and blessed. You know, during my 23 years out in LA, I did over 100 TV episodes and films, 40 different series. Um, I became the man I said I would be, and I feel very, very, very fortunate that life worked out that way. You know, lots of highs and lows, but sure. here we are in Indianapolis teaching, which is my other passion, so that career afforded me this. Outstanding, outstanding. Do um, you have any, uh, any maybe, maybe funny stories or favorite memories from your time doing Robots in Disguise? Yeah, I guess the one was I got into the booth one day and I got to the script and at the end it just said, Skybite Sings. <laughs> And I, I and I looked. I don't remember who. There's so many wonderful people. You know, I'm going to name drop and forget people. But Richard Epcar and Steve Kramer and 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 Kirk Thornton and, and Bob, the late Bob Pappenbrook. Yeah. And, and Walt Wally Winger. Oh, Wally Winger, Winger and Wendy Lee. I mean, just people yeah. who were directing. And I got too many years ago to remember exactly. Sure, but sure. They said we want you to improvise. Mike Sorich. Uh -huh. we, we, we want you to improvise. Okay. When Spikes are because they knew I was improv. So sure. when, when it came to the thing, I went, Who's the greatest shark in town? Skype, that's me. And they broke up in the booth. And I swear on my life, every time I do a convention or something, somebody goes, Sing the Skybite song. And I'm like, All right, fine, that's going to be my claim to fame. Not a problem. But it was because, again, of my improv skills. Sure. And, and I had a blast doing that. I, I tried to channel. Um, somewhere between Tom Waits and Dr. Smith from Lost in Space okay, uh -huh. for the character, you know. He was maniacal, but he had a good side and sure. had the really gravelly stuff going on, so it was a blast. It was one of my favorite things I did in California, was Transformers. And I've done two conventions, and now I teach in London twice a year with my Transformers family there. Mm -hmm. It really is a world unto itself. You don't know when you do something, that there's going to be a popularity like that. I was born in um, 1954. The Transformers movie came out in 1984. I wasn't even a Transformers kid. I didn't play with Transformers. I'm too old for that. Sure. You know? so when I, but I knew of it, and you know, it was 
It was great anime. You know, great animation. It was fun. You know, robots. It was, it was really cool. Is, it, is the Cabbage Patch Kids of its day? <laughs> I like the things a lot better than the Cabbage Patch Kids. Well, sure. Kids. I'm just saying, you know, it was, it was you know, an, an iconic. Totally iconic. You know, I had no idea about the world of anime yet. Mm -hmm. that, I just, that was as far and as far as it could be to me. You know, but it was, Transformers was such an American institution. And when I got to do um, uh, my first BotCon in 2002, mm -hmm. I sat next to Dick Godier, who was in the original yeah. cast. That, so sad he passed in the last year. But to me, he was Heine the Robot from Get Smart. Yes. You know, and when things were rotten, the Robin Hood show that Mel Brooks did on ABC in, uh -huh. in the late 60s. So, you know, we would sign autographs and then everybody would walk away and I would take that picture and go, Dick, sign that for me, you know. Because <laughs> I think the best thing uh, that I've always tried to stay in touch with is I'm a fan. I feel very fortunate to have had such experiences. And when I would go on a, uh, a studio or a movie set, or if I'm on Paramount or Warren Brothers, I would take the moment and go, look where you are, son. Look what you did. And uh, I feel proud about that. And again, I keep using the word, but very fortunate that I was able to have those experiences, you know, at this point in my life. To look back on um, my life, yeah. sitting right in front of me there, um, it's Pretty terrific. And by the way, some of those things you have on that table, I don't have a recollection of, you know, or the character itself. Yeah. Someone mentioned Mona of the Gale from Trigun the other day, and I went, okay, I'm going to have to look that back up. I really don't remember that. Yeah, there's a, there's a buddy of mine uh, that back where I'm from in uh, Terre Haute, Indiana, mm -hmm. in uh, Paris, Illinois, that region. And uh, his, his favorite character in Trigun was Mona of the Gale. What's his name? Uh, Arlen Johnson. Arlen Johnson. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, here, here's a here's a question. I, I know you said that uh, you know you, you didn't grow up with the Transformers, of course. Right. You know, you're, you're just a year younger than my dad. Ouch! Um, that that hurt. That went in really quickly. Well, no, no, no. He, he's he's you know he's, he's relatively young, but uh, <laughs> boy, you covered that nicely, by the way. Right. Right. <laughs> But I can't help but ask, ask away. do you own any Skybike toys? Yes, both hey. of them. Excellent, hey. excellent. Well, and then I get, again, get gifted by the fans of Skybikes. I have sharp plushies that were made for me. <laughs> Rebecca in France, I still have the sharp plushie sitting up on my counter. Um, <laughs> pictures, toys, I got one in my book over there that the kids me. There's a little Skybike sitting by my computer over there. Um, well, hey. It's... Uh, it's really strange to have an action figure, you know. Of course, none of us got a piece of the action, but to have the one figures. of those. But it doesn't matter, you know. It doesn't matter to me. The, the distinction of enough and plenty. Uh -huh. You know, it's never going to be enough, but you've got to know when it's plenty. You know, in, in this sense, I've had plenty. I've got an action figure. How cool oh. is that? I'm just a fat <laughs> kid from New York City who followed his dreams and wind up with an action figure. Uh -huh. My life is good, Jim. Now, what, what did you think when uh, when they re revealed that they were going to uh, come out with a new Skybike toy? In, in and by the way, this is not product placement, so I'm covering the label right here. Uh -huh. um, I thought it was great. You know, the, there's plenty for all of us. I had my shot at Skybike, now somebody else does it. I don't know even who did the voice of the, of the other Skybike. Well, no, I'm, I'm out of, of the toy. Oh, what about the, uh, the difference of them? Yeah, well, well, out of the original uh, Robots in Disguise... Was that first that came the, out the, in... Yeah, the, the one, one character that they brought back and updated in a, in a new form was Skybite, out, out of the whole cast. I mean, here recently they've started, right. you know, bringing back some of the others, except like, like, uh, like Scourge and some of them right. for Japan, but... One would only hope that they liked what either I did or even more the, the, uh, the original Japanese series did. Mm. But it, it was an honor. It was, the, I think, one of the weirder characters in, the, in R.I.D. And it was because they just, you know, gave me rope. To yeah. me. And there were such great people to work with, the guys writing and directing it. We had a blast. You know, so, again, fortunate. The other, the other Skybite, terrific. Wherever you are, here we go. We worked. There's plenty of work out there. And you just got to realize that you'll get your time if you just persevere and do this and stick around for a long time, you'll work. Yeah. You know, if you give it up. I tell my students, 
This is either who you are or what you do. If it's what you do, you're going to have some failures, you're going to have some successes, but in the end, go home to Cincinnati and get married, your parents miss you. You know, if this is who you are, welcome to your life. I'm 63 doing what I was doing when I was 16. Mm -hmm. You know, and I've had ups and downs, I've had a couple years where I stopped doing it, but this was always who I am. So, again, fortunate, to, you know, to follow that and to continue to play, you know, up until five years ago when I moved back from um, L.A., mm -hmm. I thought, well, that's it, I'm done. And no, and, and that wasn't the case. I'm working more than ever right now. Um, I just got asked to do a, 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 a spoken word event in New York City called Jesters and Troubadours that's run by a former student stand-up comic of mine, Jennifer Rawlings, really terrific performer, um, directing off-off Broadway. Uh, in New York City in the fall, I'm reading plays right now, uh, working with uh, Lung Tree Productions. Maggie, Maggie Alexander, how are you? <laughs> I'm reading plays. Um, and I come out to Indiana to, once a month to teach improvisational comedy and acting. Fantastic. Yeah, I, uh, I recall, uh, it, was, it was just this past winter, uh, down at the Art Craft Theater, you had uh, or, or was it the winter before? You had the, winter it's, before. It's a Wonderful Life. Yeah, I directed it, uh, the radio play stage version yeah. of It's a Wonderful Life. Which I, 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 had, never, uh, I had never seen some. I mean, I, I you know, seen it like, like in movies or something, mm -hmm. you know, everyone standing at the microphones. Right. Uh, but to see it firsthand, it was, it was just amazing. Because amazing, you, you, you don't pay attention to the fact that you're looking at people on stage, your mind wanders and you start visualizing. Right. The story and the events, and it just—it just—it still takes you to that other world. It's a beautiful thing about radio. I mean, you could have sat in that audience that night and just closed your eyes, and didn't have to watch the show. You could hear it, and like you said, envision right. the whole thing. And I, I had a terrific cast amalgam of such talented uh, Indiana actors, uh, and and some of my students also talented mm -hmm. that I was able to mesh into the production. Sure. So it was, it was a great one night experience, and. Uh, and so it goes, you know, you just keep finding projects you want to be a part of. Yeah, it was, it was a real treat. And I've, I've actually, uh, I've, I've got the ticket from that, the ticket stub, still in the, in the Skybuy yeah. box here. Right, because you brought that down that night, I remember. Mm -hmm. um, have you, or, or do you ever watch the old Robots in Skies show? It's hard to find. Um, I could find a copy every now and then on uh, YouTube, mm -hmm. but they don't have a... Um, a lot of it available. I haven't been able to. I got a whole Transformers thing of R.I.D. from England, but I can't play it because I have. I don't. It doesn't. It's not region one oh, DVD. Oh, I see. I see. You know. Yeah, the United States. Uh, United States never released uh, released that series on DVD. So I want. I, I, I think it might still be under under uh, Saban or Disney ownership in some way. You know, it's echoing like what's going on with Marvel and Sony right now. You, yeah. I own this character. You own that character, and. and who gets hurt are you guys? Is the fans? Right. The fans want to see it. The fans in England see it all the time. Sure, sure. But uh, I don't watch a lot of myself once I do it. Every once in a while, you know, you'll be sitting home and I'll, I'll, I'll click on the TV and go, oh, "Look at that, it's me," you know. And or I'll, someone will send me a link to something I've done. My students do that a lot and go, "I heard you doing this the other day." I went, I "Better look that up." I don't seem to remember it. You know, <laughs> 25 years, you kind of forget things after a while. Yeah. But but I don't I don't seek out myself to go watch, and I watch a lot of TV and a lot of movies and, and animation because I'm teaching it. Sure. So I want to stay current to what's going on. Mm -hmm. And I know this is not a plug, but Rick and Morty. <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> I am yes. nuts about Rick and Morty. Yes. But Matt Doby, if you're listening to this, uh, uh, Matt, uh, give me a call. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, no, as, as far as those DVDs, though, um, if I'm not mistaken, I want to say a lot of Blu-ray players now no longer do the region things that DVD players used to. Really? So if you've got a Blu-ray player, they m it might be able to play those discs. Santa, if you're listening, I need a Blu-ray player for Christmas. Yes. <laughs> worth a shot anyway. The worse that happens, you'll end up with HD quality. I've spent more watch. money on stupider things, so not, not a problem. Right, as have I. As have I. Um, 
Now, here's here's uh, uh, something I was wondering. Uh, have have we, the Transformers fans, in any way, uh, helped your career advance or opened other doors for you that, that wouldn't have changed my life? Um, Simon Plum, thank you. He, for a year, tried to get me to um, Auto Assembly, which is Europe's largest Transformers yes. convention. Uh -huh. A thousand people come to these events, and finally. Um, they brought me out in, pardon me on the years, 14? Yeah, 2014 was my first. And I had just um, been in recovery and was kind of got my life back together. And I was overwhelmed by the love and that they had known the work for so long. And, and you know, you don't know, you live in a bubble when you record this stuff. Mm -hmm. But it was, and I, and no pun, or pun intended, it was a transformational experience. They really showed me so much love. And I spent all three days on the floor in the bar with these guys. And, you know, I don't do the celebrity crap. You know, it's not, I don't just remove myself. I'm like, hi, I'm Pete from New York. Sit down. Like, like you said, Mr. Spellos. I'm like, no, no, we're going to have none of that. Well, you, you said yourself just a moment ago, you're a fan. I am a fan. You know, and, and so these people were so genuine and real, and England is just, I just love England. Um, so I went there, and it really started sparking everything again. And I wound up doing a, a cinema wasteland, a, a thing in Chicago for horror movies. Mm -hmm. And then the next year, they were having the last convention of AA before it switched to TF Nation, which is a great group of people who were part of that. Who are now running the convention and took it over? Sure. Um, and I knew they were going to bring me out. Um, nobody, you, they don't bring guests out back to back. The fans crowdfunded me. Thanks really? to, to Jamie Harris. Hi, Jamie. Hi, Fantastic. Katie. Fantastic. Um, and brought me out to the event. And they wound up. Simon wound up taking care of me too. And and, mm -hmm. and but they paid. My fans paid for my travel and airfare and food and. And made sure that I was at the last AA convention. It was. I can't. It's humbling, Jim. Sure. When you feel that kind of love from people, and from that came. I'm teaching my Transformers family in England now. Um, I've done it twice in the last year. I'm, I'm back in four months in September, mm -hmm. and we'll be there in the spring. So twice a year, I'll go to my Transformers family. And I love you guys. You changed my life, and you know it. So thank you. To all the Transformers fans, thank you. Um, so I'm doing what I love, pal. Right on, right on. Um, uh, aside from that, uh, do you have anything uh, anything extra you would like to, to say to the Transformers fans? Any special messages or it's funny you, quips? It, I don't know not, not there's many funny quips, but it's you that made me relevant again you know, in the industry when I thought I was going to retire and just kind of walk away from this all. You made me realize that there's a lot of gas left in the tank. And uh, now I, I just I just can't get enough of the teaching and the Transformers family and doing this and being, being able to give it back, you know. I'm in Act 3 of my life. Mm -hmm. You know, this is the time where a lot of people slow it down, but right now I want to go out there and do as much as I can and inspire people just by being me. And hopefully that inspires people. I mean, you, you can't try and inspire people, but I, I want to live the life. And I want to make sure that students and young voiceover artists get the support they need to do what I got to do. I had four of my students up at ACN in Chicago this weekend auditioning for Bang Zoom. And one of them got a call back. Wow. And, and, how great is that? It's their turn. I've had my turn. I've had my turn. It's it's you guys' turn now. So that's what I'm dedicated myself to, making sure that... Passing the torch. Absolutely. The next generation gets it. I got mine. I got a SAG pension. I'm on early social security. You know, <laughs> I don't need to be running around the country a lot. I put my time in. And yet, the folks here in Indianapolis and the folks in London, that's... And my community in New York, it's really where I want to go. I just want to kind of work once a month with everybody and, and someday fly off into the sunset. 
you know, but for right now. Singing as you go. Of I, well, I, Skype bite, that's me, of course, I want to, absolutely, <laughs> that's how I want to go. Singing that last great shot of him flipping up in the air over the water. Uh -huh. um, someone sent me that picture and I thought, that's just great. You know? I've never met as nice people as I have in the Transformers community. They're real, authentic kids. That was the other thing, Jim. Sitting in the bar at that first convention mm -hmm. with people who were 16 and people who were 60, all playing with the Transformers toys. Sure. How cool was this? You know, you don't want to be out in that real world. I want to be in that world. I want to be surrounded by people who are still in touch with their childhood. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the, especially the Transformers fans, just get it. Now, their fandom spreads out mm -hmm. to all kinds of stuff. Oh, you know, absolutely. And stuff that I don't even know about. I, I'm learning on a, on a <laughs> dead basis. But, I had a little, I had a little moment in the sun, and that's all I wanted. I wanted to be, you know, I became the man I said I would be when I was young. So, but it's their turn now. That's the great joy of my life sure. is is making sure those dreamers keep dreaming and get the jobs because I tell them it's going to be your turn to be me someday and pass that forward. Yeah. And uh, oh, it reminds me of a reminds me of an old saying is uh, that that. Uh, you don't stop playing because you grow old. You grow old because you stop playing. Right. Absolutely. And I don't stop playing. As I said, i got a Legion of Superheroes comic book <laughs> sitting by my computer over there. Um, no, I'll never stop playing. Since I've been doing improv my whole life, it's... You're right. You die when you stop playing. And, and why? Do what you love. I'm going to look right to all of you listening. Do what you love. Be kind to each other. Love yourself. And don't take any shit from anybody. And go after your dreams, because you can do this. You're going to have a whole mess of people in your life tell you no. As long as you're not one of them, pals and gals, do this. And, you know, I'm on Facebook. Look me up. Come to Indiana, take me out for a cup of coffee. Come to New York, take me out for a bagel. Come to England, we'll go for bangers and mansion. <laughs> <laughs> so basically just take a bite out of life. That's the great line from, from the movie... Um, Oh my God! I'm having a senior moment. Big night with uh, Stanley Tucci and mm -hmm. uh, and Ian Holm and Tony Shalhoub. And the the line is, you have to bite the life in the ass and drag it to you. <laughs> you know, and so that's there what you, you go. really got to do. Take a bite and don't um, don't take no for an answer. Right. That's what they taught me. Well, I just want to uh, go over uh, a few of your more notable roles. Uh oh, uh, see see if you might remember to, them. I, I either remember them, or even you know, if, if you might happen to remember them well enough, maybe even have uh, you know a fun little story or just maybe about it. if I remember them. Um, start off with. Uh, well, I'll go ahead and start off with, with uh, the anime uh, in in the anime Bleach. Uh, you played the role of uh, Kogana Hiko. Nope, see, I was wrong. Okay. Uh, which was one of the Shiva house guards. Okay. And then uh, an Arankar, uh, the 103rd Arankar, is Dor. Oh my goodness. Dordoni Alessandro del Socaccio. Hey, you think I remember that? <laughs> That's like <laughs> no, no, 20 it's, letters I, long. I, I, I have a new respect for you, Jim. <laughs> I actually had to go over it like four times to figure out how to pronounce it last night before, yep. <laughs> just to make sure. Um, what about uh, Dr. Bacchus in Cowboy Bebop? <laughs> Hi, Mary Elizabeth McGlynn. How are you? I had a great time. She's one of my dear friends uh, from L.A., and it was she, we knew each other so well personally. She says, I have an insane doctor for you. I went, thanks, I'm in. You know? <laughs> And brought me back in to do Cowboy Bebop the movie. Yes. You're doing a, a Russian sort of on television. Yeah, du and du Duchenko and then uh, also Queen. Basically, I was doing Harvey Fierstein the whole time. How are you, darling? I'm doing kind of that voice. You know, from Independence Day. <laughs> sure, I have, sure. I have to call my mother. You know, so that's, that's who I was channeling for that. I got you. Um, Next we've got uh, Trigun. You played the role of Monev the Gale. Nope, I have no clue. I remember playing it, and two of my students have brought it up recently, and, uh -huh. and I'm going to go online and look at it. So, I guess I was decent. People yeah. seem to remember it. <laughs> what, what was he? The, the Gale. Some sort of... 
probably the same guy. This guy, some sort of angry militant well, guard he, he or soldier. Well, he was a big dude in a, like a purple suit with an orange face visor. I have lots, at, lots of guns. I have that at home. No I'm kidding. Oh, okay. That, that, <laughs> the suit, not the guns, of course. Yeah, he he cosplays. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, this is a secret. But at Indie PopCon this year, I, I, I can't make it, but there is a rumor that someone will be cosplaying as me. That's all I have to say. So if you can cut out to Indie PopCon, which is like July 7th through 9th, it's a terrific thing here in Indianapolis. Come, come, come and play and, and go meet me. Of course, it's not going to be me, but, but go meet me. Now, are, are you saying cosplaying as one of the Gale or cosplaying as Peter Spellos? As Peter Spellos. Outstanding. Yeah, it is outstanding. Talk about my head can't get any bigger at this point. Well, we'll, we'll have to keep an eye out in the crowd for a shark fit going back and forth well, through I, the aisles. Who knows? But I'll let you know as that gets closer to the date. All right, all right. Stay in touch with Jim. Um, uh, one, one that I wasn't sure of, uh, Macross Plus, uh, it had you listed as a council member. I'm, I'm guessing that was probably just a, maybe a bit part. Again, uh, there are no bit parts, only bit actors. No kidding. Ah, um, ah. It, you. Sometimes they would call you in for pages, and sometimes uh -huh. they would call you in for lines. And, right. And it's family. Who am I this time? There's a great Kurt Vonnegut short story um, from Welcome to the Monkey House called Who Am I This Time? And if you have any aspirations to be an actor, go look that story up. And that's basically what I would say when I would get to one of those rooms. You know, they'd call me up and say, can you work on Friday? I'd go, yeah, I'm going 9 to 11. Perfect. See you then. Didn't tell me what it was. I didn't ask. You just show up and do the work. You know, it's, after a while, this community was so small, they, everybody knows everybody, and they bring you in. I never worried about any of that. Again, going back to the plenty and enough thing. Sure, sure. There's plenty. Yeah, plenty. Look at the, like a table of plenty. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. VHS even. And that's just not, <laughs> not on camera, that's just voiceover. And right, and VHS. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um. Street Fighter 2, uh, both uh, Sagat. both the animated movie and Street Fighter 2 V as uh, Sagat. That's right. That probably shot my throat for about three weeks <laughs> doing all those effects. I think I have like four lines of dialogue in that movie and the rest is fighting effects. Yeah. Love it. I mean, how often do you get to go, and they give you money? All right. I know. Um, let's see, the next one on here is Code Gyas Lelouch of the Rebellion as Bartley Asperius. I remember doing that. Kind of a fat, round, bald <laughs> guy with a thin mustache. Um, terrific. Had fun with that. Loved doing that series. They brought me back a couple times for it. Mm. You know, again, I work, was working with such great people um, over at Magnitude 8 where we used to record and with too many names to mention. And because if I leave three off, they'll kill me someday. But yeah. such wonderful people, and, and, and Sagat was fun. He was over the top and <laughs> and gruff and and angry, and, and I was doing what I love. There you go. Twenty five years ago, that I can't, I can barely remember. Uh, see, next we've got uh, in the anime Naruto uh, a character by the name of Hitode. Funny, I just saw that two months ago with a friend's three kids. Mm -hmm. um, and they kept watching it and then looking at me. Went, <laughs> no. They couldn't be, because they knew me as Peter, not as the character. And they, no, that's not you. Well, listen again. So they would, he would do the line, then I would do the line, and they'd go, oh. <laughs> so the only reason I remember Naruto was because I just saw it with three kids between the ages of four and eight. A couple months ago. Fantastic. I think it's on Hulu. I think you know one I, of the I, services. I think so, yeah. yeah. Um, Ghost of Michelle, uh, the original anime, as well as the standalone complex series, uh, different various roles. It, it did, IMDb didn't specify on that one. No, there was probably a lot of different stuff. I think one of them might have been like a guy in a getaway car. Not a surprise. I always um, played a lot of thugs in my life, on and off camera. A lot of those guys. Uh, the Big O as Rick Fraser. Wow. No clue whatsoever. 
It's a giant robot. What a surprise. Yeah, no, yeah. I'm very popular <laughs> with giant robots. But no, no, the big O. To me, is Oscar Robertson played with the Cincinnati Royals, but I'm older than all of you combined up there <laughs> to actually, for you folks, to know who that is. Um, outlaw star, uh, oh, William. Wendy Lee, I love you. Um, probably next to Transformers, the greatest fun I ever had doing animation. Because I wasn't playing this guy here. I was playing basically a bad C-3PO impression. <laughs> and loved it. I loved that I was able to get to do a voice that wasn't what I was normally booked for. And I had no clue about the subsect of Outlaw Star fans as well. Um, and again, working with all those terrific people that did that series and Wendy and, and just great times. Great, great times. And uh, I love Gilliam. Except he became a small pink suppository that looked like Groucho Marx. Yeah. What was that? <laughs> What was that? My friend Catherine Bacon, Catherine, in, uh, in Leeds, drew me a great picture of, of Gilliam like that. Uh -huh. I have it on my computer next to my Legion of Superheroes works. Uh -huh. Yeah. Nice. And the last anime one I have on the list here is in uh, the anime Rurouni Kenshin as uh, Senri Otama. Nope. No clue. <laughs> Not a clue. Okay. I'll go look at it. So, Kenshin, was I getting the, good? The Wandering Samurai is, uh, or Samurai X. Is, also called. Okay, I kind of remember. Do you remember what you were doing in 1992? Me neither. Uh, <laughs> sitting in the living room. All right. Playing Super Nintendo. All right. You were young. Yeah. Bastard. Like, it was like nine. Bastard. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and uh, as far as feature film uh, roles, uh, what one of my favorite movies as a little kid, and I, I can't seem to find a, a copy of it, The Giver. Which is based oh. on based on the manga and anime. Yes. Uh, had uh, had uh, like like Mark Hamill and I can't even think of who else. I'll go through. It. I mean, uh, first of all, Brian Houston was the producer, mm -hmm. um, who did Reanimator. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I worked with Steve Wang and Screaming Man George, the two directors. Mm -hmm. Unbelievably creative these gentlemen are. You will know Wang because he worked helping create the Predator and, and all that stuff and, and Screaming Mad. They were, they were visionaries to me. And we must have had four or five auditions uh, bringing in. And then they would bring in the stunt people to watch us walk because they wanted to do, because our zoonoids, yeah. they wanted to physically look like us because that wasn't us in the suits. You know, that was, that was the stunt guys doing right. that. Um, but <laughs> I think the only time in, in motion picture history that you could see the four henchmen as Jimmy J.J. Walker, Spice Williams, Michael Berryman, and Peter Spellos. I don't think I don't think anyone has ever said those four names in the same sentence before. And working with Mark, and it was it was terrific. We had a blast. Jack Armstrong and Vivian Wu. I mean, it was a pretty terrific cast. Yeah. Um, and again, I had no clue what the Garver was. Um, of course, Stephen and 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 Matt George did, but. Uh, I kind of caught up to it later. Mm -hmm. Fun, you know, and then Steve did the second guy, or Dark Hero, I think yeah. it was called. Um, but one of those great motion picture experiences and so much fun. We shot a lot late at night, the LA River, you know, and the LA River, which has like a cup of water in it back in the day. Um, but, but terrific. Mark was great. Uh, another, I always had fun, Jim. You know, you almost, I, it kind of gets boring unless everything was great. Well, it was, because you get out of it what you put into it. You Absolutely. know, if you show up and you have a shitty job and a shitty attitude, you're going to go home feeling shitty. You know, if you show up, one line, a hundred lines, didn't matter. I was doing what I loved. So, lots of fun with the guy. Love the guy. Excellent, excellent. Um, next one I have on here is uh, Men in Black 2 as Captain Larry Bridgewater. I have a special, more than a special place in my heart, because, um, uh, oh, God, I'm forgetting names now, the director, um, that I went to elementary school with, not Barry, Barry, 
director Adam's family. Somebody call me up right now and tell me who the director. I'm going to have to look. Or, or it up. post it in the comments. But I went to elementary school with um, kids. This is called a pre-senior moment. <laughs> well, your mind goes absolutely blank on someone's name that the minute the camera goes off, I'm going to remember. Um, it was terrific. It was on the Sony set. It was really weird because it was right around 9-11 uh, that it was getting filled. So they actually uh, shut it down and we wound up going back to work afterwards. Uh, there was a cash change from um, <laughs> The, the woman who played was in Swin Peaks, who, Lara Flynn Boyle, who took over the role. It was Famke Johnson who was yeah. supposed to play that role. Um, but on the set, Barry, it's, it's right there. I, I, I hate myself. I hate myself, by the way. Um, on the Sony lot, terrific time. Will Smith was terrific to work with. First of all, taller than me, and, and he had just done Ali. He was and with muscles. This guy was strong. Nicest guy. We had a blast. We improvised the scene a little bit. I mean, how often do you get to see two and a half subway cars literally built in the Sony, you know, on the Sony mm -hmm. sound stages? Um, I had an audition for the first <coughs> Men in Black. Here's the story that you want. I had an audition for the first Men in Black movie. I was literally one of the first non-stars hired. I was supposed to play a bartender. And uh, David Rubin was the casting director. And David, thank you for casting me a thousand times. Um, and in the bar, it was when Tommy Lee brings Will in, and it's the first time he's introduced yeah. him to an alien. I played a bartender whose face opens up, and there's a little alien inside. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, the script went through like 20 script changes, <coughs> and that character became the jeweler with the little thing in the yeah. face. Uh -huh. But they brought me into Rick Baker to do a head cast. Um, if you don't know who Rick Baker is, look him up. He was the greatest contemporary makeup special effects person, um, hands-on. It was like an honor to sit in his chair. I literally, he did the first test on me. And here I am sitting in Rick Baker's chair. Look him up, kids. Um, I was honored, and they did a whole head cast of me, and believe me, you haven't lived until three weeks later you walk in and you see your head on a stick. You know? <laughs> so they wound up, it wound up changing. So I, I, I worked, they paid me, and, but I never was in the movie. And oh. Once the strip changed. So when they did the second one, that David and, and I think Rona Kress was, was casting the second one who worked with David, um, brought me back in, because they knew the work. And sure. at the audition, and nailed it. I can't believe, um, I, I, I can't remember, not Nemiroff, it was, nope, wow, severe pre-senior moment. But anyway, we hit it off so well because we were talking about PS-173 in New York, uh -huh. and he was a year older than me, um, and it must have went on for five minutes, even before the audition. Great audition that did a couple of Larry's lines, and by the time I got home, I had booked it, you know, they said, not quite, yeah, Peter, huh? you're in. They know. You know, it, when you, they know right away whether they like you or don't. And because of my connection with the director, it was, you know, it was like going to work for family. I mean, imagine 1965, 66, you're a kid in fifth grade and you're a kid in sixth grade in a, small, in a New York City public school, and 40 plus years later, you're on the sixth grader set, the fifth grader is now acting in his movie. <laughs> it's a teeny world. It's an old saying, there's only eight people in show business and five of us know each other. And I think that's how that works. But Men in Black, blessed to have worked on Men in Black too. Mm -hmm. And they actually talk about me on the, if you have the DVD with the director's commentary, oh, wow. they talk about that whole thing and going to elementary school and knowing really? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so if you play the director's cut on the, on the DVD, you'll hear them talk about me. Fantastic. Uh, and the, the last one I have on the feature films list is uh, Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare. Oh my God. Another. That's Tracy's uh, father. Well, I got a couple stories about that. First, um, <coughs> working with Rachel Talalay, the director, um, terrific, terrific director. You'll know her now from directing a lot of the great Doctor Who episodes from the last two seasons. Uh, Sherlock, you know, she's just terrific. And 
wound up playing this really, I turned into Freddy Krueger. I mean, how iconic can that be? Yeah. It was, again, uh, the second time they had to do a head cast of me, and yeah. they took three guys three hours to get me into that prosthetic, face-stretching <laughs> makeup. And I remember being, uh, two stories, I remember being in the makeup room, and they had a uh, documentary crew there, and they wanted to film Robert. And, and Robert comes out and goes, hey, you know, I've done this a thousand times, still talk to Peter. You know, and <laughs> literally. Um, so they interviewed me a couple times, and then Robert in full Freddy regalia, you know, over in the makeup room with the Freddy fingers, going through the donuts. <laughs> like, is any, is any crawlers left? And got the Freddy fingers just moving the donuts around. I thought, I will never forget that. I did the scene with Leslie Dean, terrific actor. Um, nobody would talk to me on the set, because it was the abusive father. I, w I was seducing my daughter in the nightmare. I mean, I'm getting creepy thinking about it, and I've only watched it like one or two times yeah, since yeah. I recorded it. Uh, I'll send you some stills that I have from it. <laughs> really creepy. Until you see that shot of the turns around, there's a fat arm with the Freddy sweater on it. Uh -huh. And again, this wonderfully iconic moment. So she beats the shit out of me with a, with a, with a percolator. Um, just a great experience. Years later, and again, after the whole thing, everybody's friendly. Leslie was terrific. And again, uh, Rachel, if, I know if you never hear this, but I'm so thrilled with all your success. You're a terrific director, and thank you for casting me. Um, I'm in an elevator in an audition in Hollywood. And I walk in, and a, a woman is kind of right behind me, and I hold the door, and she walks in. And it's a big Hollywood building, maybe six floors, you know, <laughs> we're going up in. Um, I, I'm being facetious. There's sure. Yeah. And we're having kind of this moment in the elevator, and we kind of look over and smile and nod at each other. Kind of look back, and we go smile and nod. And I finally go, Look, I'm trying not to be creepy, but I swear to you, I think, I, I, have we met somewhere before? And she goes, I was thinking the same, oh my God, you're my abusive father. <laughs> Peter, Leslie, big hug, and a, hello, how are you? And I've only recently reconnected with Leslie Dean on Facebook, so wow. it's been, I put up some pictures to show her. But it was this great Hollywood <laughs> Babylon moment. I, you know, I was so fortunate that there was nobody else in the elevator for some blonde woman to scream, oh my God, you're my abusive father. Um, but that's that, that's my favorite movie from Nightmare on Elm Street 6. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, uh, you, you mentioned earlier, uh, you know, you, you doing the, the improv mm -hmm. uh, workshops. Um, here, here in Indianapolis, you do those monthly, is it? Monthly, I do uh, downtown, uh, downtown Indy. I teach, uh, Sometimes I'll teach a business of acting class on a Friday night, but I'll do an improv weekend intensive. Five hours on a Saturday, 12 to 5 on Sunday, the same thing. And then Monday and Tuesday night, I do three-hour acting classes, which are more audition skills where they get a script, they got 20 minutes to look at it, they come and they do it with me. Um, I give them an adjustment, I do it again. I take them through the audition process. Uh, and I'm a very, very... Um, <laughs> I don't want to say I have an agenda with it, but actually I have no agenda. It's like stop acting. Stop acting. Look at me. Make a connection. How does the, how does the person feel in the scene? And let the camera do the work. Make the connection with your partner. You know, And that's what I'm trying to teach them. So when they walk into that audition, they're not scared like i got to get the job. They know that their job is the audition. And, and just to stay focused. And the camera will see all that. With the improv, it's physical and on its feet. and. Um, by the time, I don't know when this is going to air, but I think we might be doing a, 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 an improv show for all these guys at the end of July here in Indianapolis. It's not, it's not set in stone yet, but uh, okay. check your local listings. Yes. Um, but it's great. So once a month I'm out here, you can actually look at my Facebook page and, and, and anybody out there and, and contact me or contact me through Jim. But yeah, I'm set for five more times till the end of the year okay. here in Indiana. And um, it's usually every month or every six, seven weeks. I, I do nine months out of the year. It works out. I'm here nine times. And then in London twice a year doing this with the Transformers family. Improvicons, how are you? <laughs> I miss you and Jaffa Cakes and I can go on and on about that. Anyway, I am back. Excellent, excellent. All right. Um, 
And, and we'll, we'll uh, you know, as, as we hear, you know, whatever dates that you have set for those, yeah, we, we'll, we'll, we'll update the TFYLP viewers as well. Absolutely. Uh, that way, you know, if they if they want to maybe uh, check those out if, if they're in the area. And feel free to, you know, follow me on Twitter at, at P. Spellos or Facebook. And I'd love to speak to you guys because, like I said, you, you've made me relevant again. And, and, and we're all in this together, gang. All right? Yes. All right. Um, I just have uh, one, one last thing. Sure. Uh, that that friend of mine, uh, he he messaged me and asked me if you would be willing to uh, read a haiku, a skybite. As long as you don't mind skybite wearing glasses, I'm fine with that. I have nothing wrong with that. There we are. Hope you can make all my chicken scratch. Arlen Johnson, this is for you. By land, seer air, my mighty countenance shines, for I am Skybite. <laughs> Arlen, thanks for caring. All right. Well, uh, I want to thank you again for uh, for sitting down with me, Peter. My pleasure, pal. And thank you for all that you've done and all that you continue to do. And thank you, fans, for loving us so much. You are probably the greatest fan community that I have ever seen. Thank you. And we appreciate that. We appreciate you. Uh, I want to also uh, remind our viewers, uh, uh, check out our sponsors, uh, CapturePrey.com. Hey, these guys. Uh, great toys, great prices, great service. CapturePrey.com. Uh, get uh, free shipping with orders of $150 or more. Um, also, uh, check out Mega Toy Fan. Uh, maximize your collection, minimize your cost with Mega Toy Fan. And our uh, newest sponsor, Ripped Apparel. Uh, check them out. Uh, use the use the code uh, TFYLP Pod at checkout and save, I believe, ten percent off your order. Um, with that, this has been uh, Jim Black and Skybite. That's me. Thanks for joining us, gang. Thanks. Make sure to check out the TFYLP podcast Saturday nights at eight o'clock. <laughs>